everyone for coming and uh, hanging out to talk about marine protected areas. So uh, marine protected area is a place in the ocean where you can't do something. And uh, usually the, the something that you would like to do in that place is fish. And so there are places where you can't catch fish. And uh, these are increasingly popular globally and here in Oregon and on elsewhere on the West Coast as a fishery management and conservation tool. The idea being it's a it's an insurance factor to help us manage fish populations and conserve biodiversity. Uh, and the question is, when you stop fishing someplace, do you actually get more fish? Do they actually work? Uh, and so there's been a lot of effort devoted to trying to figure that out. This is a paper that's now actually 10 years old by Sarah Lester and her colleagues, where they looked at studies uh, globally. Uh, so that all, each dot is a different MPA around the world. And they found studies that had compared changes in the fish and invertebrate community before and after an MPA had gone in or out inside compared to outside. And they found that, yes, on average, uh, when you stop fishing fish, you get more fish, biomass uh, and density. And the average here is something like a 400% uh, increase in fish biomass when you stop fishing things, which, like, that makes sense, right? If you're going to stop fishing, you'll get more fish. Um, but I'm sort of a pessimist at heart. And so I worry about these little red dots down here, which means that we stopped fishing inside of an MPA and we got fewer fish and not as much fish biomass. And why is that? That's terrible, right? That's not what you want to have happen. Uh, we told the fishermen that there'd be more fish, and now there's not, and this is not good. Um, and there are a few reasons that that could be happening. One could be that uh, maybe there's a predator-prey interaction. So yes, you protected the predator, and now there's fewer prey. Uh, or maybe we didn't design the MPA very well. It's too small, and the populations aren't increasing as much as you think. Um, or maybe. Uh, it, we just haven't waited long enough. Maybe these are very slow growing fish and we have to wait a long time. And so most of my research these days is devoted to thinking about the reasons that you might not see the pattern that you expect in data and what are some of the ways that we could explain uh, sort of disappointing results like that. And so uh, what uh, I'll be talking about today is first just some ecological theory that could explain why we might get different patterns in different ecological scenarios. And then two different applications of that theory to data. The first, where we have a lot of data before the MPA went into place, and we can apply some population dynamics models to predict what's going to happen after the MPA went in. And that'll be from Central California. Uh, and then a different case where we have different types of data that aren't quite as useful for that population dynamics approach, and we'll use a statistical model to explain the patterns that we see after the MPAs go in, uh, and that'll be in Southern California. And keep in mind that the, the work I'll be showing you here is extremely relevant to the management that we're, uh, we're doing on the West Coast. Um, this is a publication that just came out of California last year, the MPA Monitoring Action Plan, or MPA MAP, if you're an acronym sort of person. Um, and this is their plan for how they're going to be monitoring and managing the network of over 100 MPAs in California, leading up to a big statewide review of those in 2023. And so some of the work that I'm going to show you it was, it was included in that document. And then here in Oregon, we have a network of marine reserves, and they have a statewide evaluation coming up in the next several years as well. And hopefully some of the tools that I'll be showing you could be useful uh, in the Oregon case as well. So I said I would start with theory. And so the, the basic idea here is that to understand what happens when you stop fishing a population, it's helpful to think about what happens when you fish a population. Right? What does fishing do to a population? And basically, fishing takes out the old big fish. And so this is a population age distribution. So we've got age classes along the x-axis and the relative abundance along the, the vertical axis. And so typically in a fish population, you have a lot of little fish, little young fish, and fewer old fish because they die. Um, and if the population weren't fished at all, you get the blue line. And once you start fishing it, we tend to take the big old fish. And so you get the red line. And so there's these fish that are missing here in the fish population. When you stop fishing, you begin to fill that back in. Fish get older and bigger. The trick is that that takes time, right? It takes time. It takes one year for a fish to get one year older, right? Uh, not surprised. That makes the math a lot easier, by the way. Uh, and so it'll take time to see that change. Uh, and so we can write out uh, mathematical models to predict how long that would take and how big of an increase we'd see after the MPA goes in. And so what this is showing is the time course after reserve goes in for sort of a typical rockfish species. And the vertical axis is the ratio of abundance of fish uh, after the MPA to the, at the time of implement implementation. Uh, and you can see that this is assuming that there's sort of a constant number of uh, larval recruits coming in each year. Uh, so that's not changing with ocean conditions or anything. 
that you eventually increase to a maximum. And the maximum you increase to is bigger if you've been fishing it beforehand. Right? So uh, the, more, the blue line is a lot of fishing and the red line is little fishing. And so you get a bigger relative increase if you were start, starting from a lower point. Uh, again, this is like not rocket science, but it does help to be able to write this down in a formal way so we can set expectations. And so we can write out, eventually, our expected increase is uh, this ratio of, of two variables, m plus f over m, where m is the natural fish mortality rate and f is the fishing mortality rate. Right? So if we're fishing it more, we'll get a bigger increase. And the size of the increase also depends on how long the fish lives, how, long, how high is, it natural, is the natural mortality rate. Um, and we, are, we can also say how fast this whole process will happen, and that's this uh, geometric rate e to the minus m. Basically, shorter-lived fish respond faster because it doesn't take as long for the fish to get to the oldest ages. Right? So we can take this sort of thing and make predictions for different fish. So these are four fish that are of particular interest down in California, and actually here in Oregon, too, for some of them. Um, basically taking the level of fishing and the natural mortality rate that we know from the stock assessment for the species and making a prediction, oh, okay, if you predict it in an MPA, how much of an increase will you see? So the red line is in uh, fish abundance. Oh, that doesn't work. So the red line is uh, fish abundance, and the blue, the blue line is if, you, instead of counting fish in terms of numbers, you're counting them in terms of biomass. Um, so you, you see a bigger increase in biomass, and this all depends on the life history of the fish, or the invertebrate in the case of red sea urchins, and how much we've been fishing it beforehand. For example, the fishery for Boccaccio was closed in California for a long time, and so you're not going to expect to see a big increase if you continue to not fish it. Right? Okay, so all of this so far has been pretty simple because we've assumed that we're getting the same number of larvae coming into the population every single year, uh, and we know that's not the case. So these are data from uh, larval, uh, larval samplers uh, up in Monterey, uh, for two different groups of rockfish, the uh, kelps, gophers, black and yellows, and coppers. These are fish that it's really hard to tell them apart by species when they're really tiny, so we group them into these complexes. And then the olive and yellowtail rockfish complex. And uh, this is from 2000, 2008. And the vertical axis here is on a logarithmic scale. So we have multiple orders of magnitude differences in how many new fish you have coming into the population each year. And so you have big pulses and then big gaps, and big pulses and big gaps. That variability is going to translate into huge variability in the population and how fast it can recover after the MPA goes in. Now, it'd be nice if we had a way of explaining when you get a good year and when you get a bad year, so we could predict that, right? Um, and back in 2010, uh, my collaborator, Jen Cassell, published a paper showing that, hey, we can really predict this quite well. Um, these are those two different complexes, both in Monterey and down in Southern California in the Channel Islands. Uh, and there were really nice predictive relationships uh, with different oceanographic factors. So uh, the KGBC guys were really well predicted by the back and upwelling index. When you got more upwelling, you got more larval fish, which makes sense that these are sort of cold water assemblages that depend on high product of uh, upwelling waters. The, um, and the OITs were predicted by either the back end index or the uh, level of longshore currents. That was really cool. And the problem with publishing some, uh, something like this is that if you keep collecting data, sometimes the story changes. Uh, and so uh, Jen continued collecting data up through, uh, uh, shoot, Did I, oh, sorry, the label didn't quite come through. This is what I just showed you, and this is uh, going from 2011, so the year after this was published, up to 2017, and that nice R squared of 0.6 is now 0 0.06. So uh, <laughs> turns out things got worse. So now we're not quite sure what's, what's going on with these guys, uh, but we do still know that it's highly variable. Uh, and Jen and her group are, are working on what oceanographic factors could be explaining that variability. Okay, but if we go back to our nice simple expression for how much of an increase in fish biomass or abundance we should see, we can also write down an expression for what the variant should be. So that sort of long-tailed, peaky distribution of larvae tends to follow sort of a log-normal distribution. And so we can write out an expression for the standard deviation of the log normal distribution. And then we can write out an expression for how that translates into the standard deviation and the abundance of the total population. And that is a little complicated, but basically all it's saying is that if you add up the number, the vari variation in recruits coming in at age one, 
after age two, that cohort will be a little bit smaller, age three will be a little smaller, age four will be a little smaller. So a pulse comes in and then gradually dies over time. That's all this is doing. And this is just saying that if you have correlation, if you have a big pulse in one year, and that means that you'll probably have a big pulse the next year as well, uh, you have to account for that, that covariation. Uh, and this is all written out in the paper that was led by a postdoc down in California that I was working with. Um, Hopefully, there's not very much of that covariation, and so we just get this nice, simple expression for, um, for the variation. So again, we just are saying that a cohort comes in, and then it, that the effect of that cohort gradually dampens over time. And so if we account for that variation and the dampening of it, we can express the variability in the total abundance. And so we can take those nice, just single curves that I showed you before, and now put variability around them to account for how that year-to-year -year variation and how many new recruits are coming into the population. And so on these graphs, the blue curves are what I was showing you before, and now I've used that analytical uh, expression for the standard deviation to put a blue shadow around that. And then the red is if you actually simulate it with a, a model where you put in random variation, and you can see that our approximation is, uh, is getting a very similar answer to what happens if you actually simulate it. The really troubling thing is, earlier I was showing you these curves, we have a big increase in abundance. But if you look at this, this is a pretty reasonable value of the standard deviation around larval variability of standard deviation of, of, of about one, actually a coefficient of variation of one. Uh, and these error bars effectively span zero. So this is basically saying that for the amount of variability we're seeing in natural populations, even though on average we'd expect to see an increase in abundance inside an MPA, there's so much variability in larval Populate, the larval part of the population, that we might never actually detect that, that increase. We're just as likely to see no change as we are to see change that's pretty big. So how do we know whether we put in an MPA and we don't see a change in the population? Is that because the MPA is not working or is that just because everything is noisy and you can never detect anything? So the things we need to know to make predictions are the natural mortality rate M, the fishing mortality rate F, and the standard deviation of larval abundance, sigma sub r. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do, now that we've done all the theory stuff, um, is show you how we can use all of that to understand what's happening in an actual MPA when we can know some of those quantities. Okay. So this is going to be an example from Central California. Uh, with blue rockfish, which is one of the most abundant fish nearshore species in kelp forests in Central California. And what we're going to do here is estimate F, the fishing rate, and that sigma, the variability in larval recruitment, from data collected before the MPA went into place. We're going to get natural mortality from other sources, stock assessments and things like that. And then we're going to forecast what should happen after the MPA goes in, forecast the variability around that, and see if that matches up with the data and see if we actually can successfully predict how soon we see an increase in abundance and how big that increase is. After I show you that, I'm going to show you an example with less data. So in this example, the MPAs went into place in 2007, and we have people collecting data in the water from 1999 up to 2007. So lots of data beforehand to make a good prediction afterwards. In Southern California, on the Channel Islands off the coast of Santa Barbara, the MPAs went into place in 2003, and we didn't have as much data beforehand to support that sort of model projection that I'm going to show you. Uh, and so we can't estimate how much fishing there was before the MPAs went into place, but we do have good information on larval variability, and so I'm going to show you a way of accounting for that variability to understand the trends after the MPA went into place. Okay, so first, going back to uh, Central California, this, these are the MPAs along Central California, the red boxes are places where you can't fish for anything, and the blue boxes are places where you can fish for some things, but not for rockfish. And they went into place in 2007, and they're on a five-year evaluation cycle. So we're supposed to go out, and, and uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife writes a report every five years saying, are they working or not? Um, if we zoom in to uh, Point Lobos, this is just south of Monterey, um, there are some uh, uh, you can see the, this is the place where you had an, a pre-existing MPA that was put into place in 1973, that's the yellow polygon, and then the new MPA in, in 2007. 
And these blue dots here are places where uh, PISCO, the uh, Partnership for Inter Interdisciplinary Study of Coastal Oceans, has been surveying kelp forest fish populations since 1999. And what's pretty cool is that there are places that they were surveying, I keep forgetting that doesn't work. There are places that they were surveying that weren't in the MPA in 2006, that then became inside the MPA in 2007. So we can, we can um, see the change that happens after the MPA gets into place. Okay, and so this is work that I've done with uh, Mark Carr, who's part of PISCO down at Santa Cruz, who runs the kelp forest surveys, and Rick Starr, who's with California Sea Grant and Moss Landing, and also does hook and line surveys off the coast of these MPAs. And so these are some of the data, just looking at the total number of fish uh, on transect samples inside the kelp forests, starting in 99 and going forward. The MPA went into place in 2007, where that dashed line is. And yeah, there's not a big difference, right? Um, so the red is inside the MPA, the blue is outside, and those things are just crossing over each other. There's not really a whole lot going on. Then you, the MPA goes in here, and we're just not seeing big changes. Uh, so this is a little disappointing. Um, and so there's two possible explanations. One is that maybe that just wasn't a place that was fished very much, and so maybe we don't expect to have a big change. Um, or two, maybe there's so much variability in recruitment. I've shown you that there's a lot. Maybe that's just totally obscuring the MPA effect. There's so much ups and downs in the populations because of larval processes that you just can't see a signal of the MPA itself. So the approach that we took to answer that question is to use what we call state space population models to better interpret the monitoring data and see if we can sort out those two hypotheses. And we'll use these models to estimate the amount of fishing that was happening beforehand and quantify the amount of recruitment variability. Okay, so what's a state space population model? Uh, well, I'll explain. Um, and I'm gonna explain with a pretty simple cartoon. The idea is that we're talking about the state of a population. That's just whatever thing you care about that you're counting, the number of fish or the number of widgets in a factory uh, assembly line or something, just what, whatever you're keeping track of. And the idea of any mathematical model is that you want to be able to take the state at one time and predict how much of it you'll have in a different time. So if we start off at time zero and predict time one, we have a model, we've written this fancy model and plugged in all sorts of parameter values and we make a prediction. And it turns out that we're not quite exactly right, that reality is slightly different. And that's almost always true because of something called process error. Just that there's even if you have really, really good estimates of mortality rates and birth rates and things, there's going to be year-to-year -year variability in what that actually is. And so the actual population will never be exactly what your model predicted that it would be. Which is fine after just one year, but if you keep trying to make predictions, those errors will accumulate and you'll get further and further away. The model will drift away from reality. That's in a regular model. A state-based model tries to fix that problem. Because at every time step, you compare the model to data you've collected from the population, and you update the model's prediction to account for that process error, and along the way, measurement error as well, because data are never perfect. And the end result is that your next forecast is much closer to reality than it otherwise would be. So we're basically accounting for those little wiggles in the population, the process error, and getting a better estimate of what's happening in the population. So the data that we have from the divers is we have the abundance and the size of fish in each year at each site. These divers go along transects and they count every fish they see in 30 meters along a 30 by two meter by two meter transect. They count every fish and they size every fish to the nearest centimeter. It's really fantastic. Um, and so the model we wrote uh, is also size based and it has a size uh, the, the discrete, it discretizes the size to a single centimeter. So it matches up the data that we have. And the model includes the growth of fish from year to year, the mortality of fish, and fishing. Okay, and those things could all vary by size. Um, if you're interested, this is the model equation. This is what we call an integral projection model. Basically, it gives us, if you have the number of, sorry, we'll start over here. If you want to know the number of fish of size y at one year in the future, you take the number of fish that were at size x the previous year, multiply it by the probability of going from size x to size y. So that probability is going to include how fast you grow and how much do you die, what's your probability of survival. And then you integrate that over all possible sizes. So you basically take all the sizes at year one and account for growth and mortality and all those things, birth, and project to the next year. 
So this is becoming a really common tool in population ecology. Uh, so this was a paper from 2014 that I didn't write. Uh, but here's a paper from 2016 that I did write that, uh, that says, how do you take this thing and put it into that state space format so you can actually fit it to data, a time series of data? Uh, and these are some of the folks that I work with to do this work. Uh, Carrie Nichols uh, was a postdoc when I first started, uh, we first started doing this, and now she is faculty at Cal State Northridge. And then Alan Hastings, Lou Botsford, and Marissa Basket are some of my longtime collaborators at UC Davis. And, and the work I'm going to show you today uh, is a paper that just came out this summer uh, in Journal of Applied Ecology that we started writing when Carrie was postdoc nine years ago. Um, OK, so we have the data. I'm going to show you sort of how this model works, but with cartoons, not with like equations and stuff. So uh, basically, you start off with the number of fish you have at each size, time t, so 20, 2007, let's say. We add in how many larvae come into the population. We let everybody grow and die. We let things get fished. And then we apply some random noise to the population and say, here are some different possible outcomes in the next year, we then simulate the way you sample those data, compare that to the data. For example, if you don't count little fish because you can't see them, that's that sort of filtering that you put in right there. Compare that to actual data and then use that comparison in what we call a particle filter to get the best weighted estimate of all of those to get our best estimate of what's happening the next year. <coughs> so that's a state space process of updating everything. Um, along the way, we estimate how much process error there is, so how much variability is there in mortality and growth and things like that. We estimate the, me the measurement error. We can estimate unknown parameters, like how many larval recruits are coming in and how much fishing is there. Uh, and this is a Bayesian tool, so that means that we can take prior estimates of things like the level of fishing from a stock assessment, let's say, and use that to guide our parameter estimation to make it better. Okay, and I'm happy to talk about all the details of this uh, afterwards if you like, but I'm going to stop talking about the model now and just show you some results. So remember that 10 minutes ago when I started talking about this, the whole goal of this was to estimate how much fishing there was before the MPA went in. And so that's what we did. Um, on the left here, these are fits of the model to data. Okay, So the gray bars, this is length, this is abundance. The gray bars are what the divers out there in the water were counting. How many fish of each size? And this black curve is the model estimate. So in general, the model is capturing the size distribution. Some years you have really big recruitment pulses, and the model says, oh yeah, there's some recruits, and then some older, larger fish. Some years the model didn't work very well. And I'm deeply sorry about that, but sometimes it just doesn't work quite as well. But overall, we got a big, a big, a pretty good fit. Um, and we were able to estimate what the fishing rate was. This is that Point Lobo site that's just around the corner from Monterey. Going in, our prior estimate of fishing from the coastwide stock assessment, this is, that's a stock assessment that spans uh, Oregon down to Point Conception, California. The estimate of the fishing mortality rate was about 0 .9, 0 0.09. So right here, our estimate of the local fishing rate was twice that, 0.18. So there's a lot more fishing at that one site that's right around the corner from Monterey Harbor uh, than there is coastwide. Right? So that's good information. It means that we, our projections of what's going to happen when the MPA goes into place should be uh, a lot different. And so what are those projections? So what I'm showing you here is the red line is what we estimate should be happening inside the MPA over time if fishing is totally stopped, given our prior estimate of fishing. And the sort of red cloud around that is the variability due to larval recruitment, due to our estimate of how much variation there is in larval recruitment. Uh, and so year zero there is 2007, and so we're going decades into the future here. Uh, and the blue line is what would happen if we continued fishing at the same rate, at that same 0.18 per year rate. Okay. The dots on there are data that were collected inside the MPA site, so that's the red, and the blue was collected in the reference site. Okay. And so there are a few takeaways here. First, we stopped fishing, and you'd expect, and I should say these data did not go into the model fit at all, these are separate. Uh, so these, these, were, we were not, these were not seen by the model, we're just laying them on top. And so the model suggests that you put in the MPA, you stop fishing, and the population keeps getting smaller. Okay? And then eventually it goes up. And what's happening there is for the three or so years before the MPA went in, no larval recruitment happened whatsoever. 
So the population was shrinking on its own because it wasn't getting any, any new babies coming in. And then once some recruitment finally happened, it began to increase. And that's actually what you see in the data as well. So these, the first three years of survey data are going down. This is like the managers are like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Our MPAs are collapsing the population. But no, eventually it went up again, and the, and the model tracks that. So the model's doing a good job of tracking that. The other takeaway, though, is that you'd expect to see almost the same thing if you just kept on fishing. Right? And that's because the, the main trend of the population was driven by that lack of larval recruitment, not necessarily by the fishing. So you, you, uh, if you account for that, you see that you're not expecting to see a big difference between the MPA site and continued fishing for many years. It might be hard to see in the back these two clouds, but they only get some white space between them right here after 25 years. So all that uncertainty due to the larval stage is making it really hard to say that we're going to be able to detect changes due to the MPAs. So that's the bummer. Uh, it's going to take some patience uh, to see effects of these MPAs. Uh, now, we did this for a few different sites up and down the coast where we had data. Um, and so at Point Lobos, I mentioned that the fishing mortality rate was very high. And so we expect to see some effect, but it'll be slow. Further south at Big Creek, this is off the coast of Point Sur, of, of Big Sur. Uh, it's much harder to get to, right? It's pretty inaccessible. And we estimated the fishing rate was almost zero there because you know, almost nobody goes there to fish. Uh, and so we don't expect to see any change whatsoever in that population. That's also borne out by the data. And like, yeah, right, duh. Um, but this is an important thing to write in the report that's presented to decision makers to explain why is it that you don't expect to see uh, a, um, a big change in big, uh, off the coast of Big Sur? It's because nobody's fishing there. Now, the way we can quantify that ability to make a decision, which is really what this is all about, uh, is using what's what we call ROC, Receiver Operating Characteristics. Basically, the idea here is that anytime you want to make a, a management decision about whether there's more of something inside the MPA than outside the MPA, you have to choose a cutoff. You have to say, okay, if there is twice as much stuff in the MPA, then I'll say, yes, the MPA is, is working. Well, what if you make your cutoff a little bit lower? Like, well, maybe I just say there's a 0.5 increase uh, inside the MPA. We'll, we'll call that an actual increase. Right? This is like choosing your p-value cutoff when you're doing a statistical test. There's always a trade-off in that. Right? If you make the cutoff too strict, then you will never detect a, an ecological change. Right? You will have a really high um, probability of missing a, a true effect. So you have low power. Effectively, right? If you make your cutoff too small, you, you'll say there's change with just a very small difference, then you're very likely to be making a, a mistake, a type 1 error in statistics. Right? So we have the probability of a false detection thinking there's an MPA effect when there's really not, and the probability of making a correct detection, correctly assessing that there's been a change inside the MPA relative to outside. Well, if we're at a place like Big Creek, those two things have a direct trade-off. If you, uh, no matter what cutoff you choose, uh, increasing the probability of detecting things correctly leads to an increase in false detection. You just can't make a decision. If you, no matter what decision you have, there's a 50-50 trade-off as to whether you're right or not. So there's basically no information. At Point Lobos, the information content increases over time. So by the time you're 20 years out, you have this pink curve it's like here, which basically says that you have a, if you could choose your cutoff, you can choose one that gives you a really high probability of being right with a low probability of being wrong. So that's great. And so we can quantify for different scenarios how our decision ability improves over time and you can use this to say, okay, let's wait 20 years to make sure we're making a good decision and not be hasty. Okay, so that's what we can do when we have enough, model, uh, enough data to parameterize a big fancy model. There are other cases where we don't. And so I mentioned earlier the California Channel Islands. So these were MPAs that were put into place. Here they are off the coast of Santa Barbara. Uh, much warmer water. Uh, these were all put into place into 2003, and they're all no take for kelp forest fishes, um, and they also have the same mandatory assessment process. We don't have enough data because we only started collecting data in 1999. We don't have enough data to estimate those fishing mortality rates beforehand, but what we do have is Jen Cassell and Kirsten Gerwood-Culvert going out and sampling larvae. And the way they do this 
if you haven't seen a uh, talk on this, uh, is what, what we call SMURFs. These are standardized monitoring units for the recruitment of fishes. I did not make up that acronym. I think Mark Carr did. Um, and basically, these are rolls of plastic that look like kelp forest habitat. Right? Don't they look like kelp forest habitat? Imagine you're a very stupid larval fish. Okay. Uh, it's basically the fish larvae are swimming around. They encounter this habitat, and they settle to it. You can then go out uh, on a snorkel, put a net around it, bring it to the surface, rinse it out, and count all the larval fish. And because it's a standardized unit of habitat at different sites, you're getting a standardized estimate of the larval potential larval settlement to your habitat at all these sites. All right. And so uh, Pisco and their team has been going out and doing this at various sites around the Channel Islands. So here are the four uh, westernmost Channel Islands and northernmost as well. Uh, so San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. Um, the red lines are the MPAs. The uh, black line, I know you can't read these, it doesn't matter, they're just, you know, they're named names. The point is that there's a lot of little black dots. Those are places where the kelp forest fish assemblage has been sampled in the same way that they were sampled up in Point Lobos. And the blue ones are places where smurfing has been done. So we have fewer smurfing sites, but there are smurfing sites around all the MPAs. Uh, and I'll put in a pitch right now for last month's issue of Oceanography, which was devoted to Pisco and the 20-year anniversary of all the data collection and synthesis efforts at Pisco, including a few different papers about monitoring and uh, the dispersal and recruitment work that we've been doing and the, some of the tools that we use. So that's all open access and online. If you'd like to check it out, you can find the link on my, on my website. Okay, so uh, just skipping right to the data. These are data from the Smurfs, so the numbers of larvae on, uh, collected on Smurfs, so kelp bass larvae per Smurf per day. So this is the kelp bass, kelp bass, uh, Paralibax clafratus. This is one of the most common kelp forest fishes in Southern California, also a very popular target for recreational fishing. Okay. And also one of these species that really does well in terms of its propensity to settle into these Smurfs. So we get good estimates of larval settlement to the Smurfs. And uh, here's what it looks like. So I've organized these sites vertically by location. So they're grouped by the island and then site within the island. And then we have time going from 1999 all the way up to 2016 here. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of variability in space, right? So there's some places where you get a lot of larvae, hundreds of Smurfs, or sorry, hundreds of larvae per Smurf per day in some places, uh, but not in others. And huge variability from year to year. Right? We have good years and good years, but at the same sites, really bad years. So lots and lots of variability. We can also look at a similar kind of plot, but for the adults. So these are adult kelp bass. We have more sites. That's why there's more bars now, but arranged in pretty much the same way. So by island uh, and then by site within island. And um, the, uh, actually, and these are arranged by MPA as well. So the Scorpion MPA, uh, South Point MPA. Um, similar variability, big good years for kelp bass followed by not as good years for kelp bass. And some sites are better than others in terms of the abundance of kelp bass. Now, what we can do is say, which ones of those sites are inside MPAs? And so the yellow bars are sites that are inside MPAs. The bars, the ones that are not in yellow, are not inside MPAs. And, you know, if you're an MPA manager, what you want to see is colors that start off kind of dark and get brighter over time because there are more fish growing inside the MPA. And, yeah, yeah you don't see that. <laughs> uh, darn. Maybe this one, maybe, right? It's really noisy. Like, you get, you get a really good year here and then not so much in a good year, but that's not even an MPA. Here's an MPA and nothing's happening. What's going on here? This is really noisy, too. So, um, maybe theory can help explain what's going on here. So remember, I wrote down this equation uh, a while ago and then proceeded to not really use it. And you were wondering, why did you waste my time? Well, now we're <laughs> going to use it. So uh, we have this expression for how much variability we should have in adult abundance due to larval variability. And the idea was that you have a pulse of new recruits come in and the cohort declines over time. And then you get another pulse and it declines over time. And so that means that maybe we could create sort of an index of what should be happening in the adult population that's sort of a discounted sum of how much recruitment is happening in the past. And so if we do that for 
let's say, the population inside the Scorpion MPA. So the, uh, the blue curve there is the number of fish per transect in the Scorpion MPA, and you can see it kind of wibbles around and goes up and then comes back down. Uh, and the black dots are this larval index, the abundance of larvae coming in in the past, discounted by how long ago they came in and what the, larval, what the mortality is of that cohort. And you can see it tracks reasonably well. You go up, and you come down, and then you go up, and you come down, and then you go up, and then you start to come down. Not perfect, but it's clearly explaining some of the variability. And so we can propose some statistical models that would account for that potential of influence of the larval supply on the adult population dynamics. Okay, so uh, the first one would be that the abundance at a given time it's just a function of time since the MPA went in. Uh, it'd be pretty cool if that was it, right? It's just a nice linear increase uh, after the MPA goes in because you're getting more fish because you're not fishing them anymore. Uh, or, you know, we could actually use our population dynamics model and write an expression like what I showed you at the beginning where the population goes up at first and then sort of levels off. And so that would look like something like that. So it might be a little more complicated. Um, or we could use our expression about larval uh, the larval abundance and the, the effect of larval cohorts coming in and write a model that accounts for that and accounts for that stochastic effect of recruitment. Um, we could also remember that, oh yeah, they're called kelp bass and so we should include the effect of kelp because we've shown previously that you get more recruits moving from the smurf to the adult habitat if there's actually kelp there. Yeah, it's not an accident that they have that name. So we have a few different models we can try to fit to all these data sets. Um, and what I did is I fit all those models to the data at both MPA sites and reference sites where fishing is still going on. And I picked the best model uh, in general, um, which almost always had a recruitment effect and a kelp effect, but no MPA effect. And this is the best model as picked by uh, AIC, so information criteria. Basically explaining what's the simplest model that explains the pattern in the data. Okay, so this is for the Scorpion MPA, the one I was showing you before. And so the black dots are the abundance inside the MPA, and the um, red curve is just the effect of time, assuming that there's a linear increase due to um, due to the MPA. The blue curve is the one that actually includes the population dynamic thing. Neither of these came out as the best model, and actually neither of those had a significant effect of time. And, you know, P was much greater than 0 0.05. The one that worked the best was the one that had recruitment and kelp in it. And you can see that does trace out the peaks and valleys in the data much better than the others do. We can do that for another site too. Uh, this is for the Painted Cave MPA on Santa Cruz Island. And you can see that the time model and the, the other model just aren't explaining any of the variability at all. But the one that has recruitment and kelp in it is doing quite a good job of tracing out the ups and downs in the model. So what does this mean? It means that just expecting things to increase over time inside the MPA is not going to work at all. What does, what does work is accounting for the fact that stochastic variability in recruitment is really driving the patterns and abundance of this fish. And what matters most is how many larvae did you have coming in a few years ago, not whether you're in an MPA or not. This is not great news, right? Um, it turns out we can explain this a little bit better if we um, uh, look at the geography of this place. So what you have to know about these islands is that you have cold water currents coming down this way, uh, and kelp bass don't like cold water. You have warm water coming in this way, and a gyre right here that tends to aggregate larvae and deliver them to these sites right here. And so um, these spots tend to not show very much change at all, and it's because there's not a lot of recruitment. These places showed MPA's not doing very much at all, but the reference site's increasing, and that's basically because they're getting a lot of larvae coming in, and since 2003, their populations have increased because they got more larvae. Uh, this is another place we get a lot of larval recruits. Uh, and so even uh, non-MPA sites are increasing. And these are places that have had, had not much larval recruitment recently. And so even though they're inside MPAs, the populations are shrinking. So we've got lots of variability explained just by understanding the oceanography, not so much by the MPAs. Okay, so our MPA effects totally driven by larval recruitment. This would be very disappointing if I've been doing MPA models for the past 15 years saying that 
you know, you take away fishing and you get more fish, and I've just shown you that's not true at all, that it's all driven by just random noisy stuff. Um, but all's not lost. If we go back to our theory of, of filling in, right? This is this expectation that one thing that will happen is that we'll get more old fish over time. Well, you'd also expect to get more big fish over time. So this is the same kind of plot, but with length on the x-axis instead of age. And the idea is that if you go from the pre-MPA fish state, we should see an increase in that size distribution as you get more big fish. Well, something that people have tried to do to tease out that expectation is to look at changes in the average size of fish inside MPAs. And so, for example, this is a plot of the average size of fish in, um, in this Painted Cave MPA on the west side of, of Santa, Santa Cruz Island. Uh, the problem with that is that all that variability in recruitment really confounds any estimation of average size. Because if you get a big pulse of little guys come in, that's going to draw your average size down. And so that, that regression is actually not significant, even though it kind of looks like maybe it's going up. Um, and that's because you can see these cohort effects moving through. You get a big pulse of recruits in 2005, right here, and that really draws down the size distribution. And then you don't get any recruitment coming through. And that's partly why you see an increase in average size, just because the population might be shrinking, but fish are, getting, are just getting older. Okay. So that increase is all due to that change in, in that cohort moving through. So this seems really problematic. You can't just look at average size and tell anything. What you can do is ask how similar is the size distribution to the expected unfished size distribution. And so when I wrote this paper back in 2013, I said that one way of telling how far along the population is to filling in to the unfished age distribution is to calculate this thing we called a theta, which is just the angle between those two lines. If you imagine, uh, imagine in your head a fish with only two age classes, let's say juveniles and adults, you could describe those two age classes as a vector in space, right? It's, a, it's coordinates in space. One, you know, like a one and a two and a one and a three would look something like that. And you could tell how similar those two are by the angle between those. Okay. Well, now imagine if you could uh, a fish with 20 age classes. And so now we have vectors in 20 dimensional space. Ah, I tricked you. You can't imagine that. You can't imagine 20 dimensional space, <laughs> right? But you can, do, you can do the math, right? You can say how similar are those two things. And you can uh, describe that using trigonometry with this theta. Bigger thetas mean they're further apart, and closer to zero means that they're lying flat on top of each other. We can do that for age distributions. You can also do that for size distributions and measure the filling in. And there's the equation. If you remember high school geometry, you get your arc cosine and all sorts of things like that. That's OK. So what we did is use that same size-based model to figure out what that eventual unfished stable size distribution should be. And that's the blue curve on these plots. And then we measured how similar the black distribution was to the blue distribution every year, only for the sizes that are open to the fishery, so not for the little guys. And sure enough, you see a decrease over time in that index, meaning that even though there's lots of variability due to the larvae, if you just look at the, the older, larger fish, you're seeing them get older and larger and bigger, and the MPA is working. It's converging on the stable size distribution. Um, so we've got a really nice signal of filling in. It's not as sensitive. If you do the same thing for reference sites in that location, you don't see filling in because you're still fishing. So that's pretty cool. Um, we can do this for several of the sites where you have enough fish to actually look at the size distribution. We kelp bass are abundant enough. Uh, so for example, here at Gull Island, the red line is going down. So inside the MPA is going way down. The reference sites are also um, maybe decreasing a little bit, but certainly not as much. Um, at Anacapa, things are a little bit messier, but this is also not an MPA where we would necessarily expect a lot of change over time because this MPA went into place in 1973, so it should actually be stable at this point. Um, still not exactly sure why that population is doing what it's doing. Um, and then at the Scorpion SMR, uh, we're actually not seeing a big signal of filling in. And what we think is happening there is unlike the Painted Cave I showed you earlier, we have an MPA that's completely enclosing a kelp forest patch. This is an MPA where you have a kelp forest that spans the entire northern peninsula here. And so it, the MPA spans the kelp forest. So you have fish who 
can't read the stop sign. You know, they cross over into the part of the kelp forest that's fished and get fished. And so this is a, an MPA that might not be as effective because the fish are still able to move into fished areas. Okay, so to wrap things up here, uh, we're using models to set expectations for population recovery. And setting those expectations is really important because you're not always going to get what you'd expect. We're well, not always going to get what you might want or what you promised if you were an advocate for putting in MPAs, which is that you'd get lots more fish instantly. Right? So we've got to know how long it's going to take to detect changes and how different MPAs might differ in that expectation for change. Those expectations are really driven by prior fishing rates. If you had fished it more, you expect more change. But in a lot of these temperate systems, unlike coral reef systems, year-to-year -year variability in recruitment really drives the population dynamics. It makes it much, much more difficult to detect changes. So if we can account for that, we can understand what's going on. Uh, and then what the ultimate goal is forecasting this. And so we need to re be revisiting these explanatory oceanographic variables that could explain when we can expect a new pulse of recruits, and thus how soon we could expect to see changes inside the MPAs. Um, so a lot of this work was funded by NSF and California Sea Grant, California OPC, whose logo I forgot to put up there, and PISCO, which is uh, funded by the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. So we're very appreciative to them. Uh, and I will put in a plug for my book that's just published this month. So if you want to read more about the sorts of models I've talked about here, you can go get the book on the Oxford uh, website. Thank you very much. MPAs. I just read a uh, paper for the Virgin Islands Coral Reef Monument in which they didn't see an effect of the monument. It was the same inside and out. Yeah, so there's a lot of debate about exactly how MPAs are working in, in um, coral reef systems. And I should separate, there's a lot of studies looking at the effects of MPAs on the corals themselves and whether MPAs provide protections to corals, which is equivocal. The idea being that the MPAs protect herbivorous fishes, which then might reduce macroalgae, which then might promote corals. And depending on where you look, that might be true or not. Um, but there are a number of studies, mostly from the 1990s and 2000s, looking at MPAs in um, uh, Australia and uh, the east coast of Africa and some places like that, where the rate of change of, of fish populations was very rapid inside the MPAs. Um, and what I was really getting at is that in a lot of those systems, the larval recruitment and reproductive processes happen in a much faster time scale. These are fish that reproduce every month or a few times a year, and uh, growth rates are faster, and so the, the pace of change is faster, and so we can expect to see faster, faster responses. Um, although all the other caveats still apply, that it depends on how much fishing is happening, depends on whether you're actually really not fishing them after the MPA goes in, and things like that. Um, so rockfish are, are slower than other fish to reproduce in age. Right. Um, so are you just counting large fish as mature fish that are old enough to reproduce? Is that what you're saying? So uh, it's a good question. Uh, the spots in there, especially towards the end when I was talking about like large fish, meaning large kelp bass, I was only talking about the um, fish that are over the legal size limit. So essentially catchable fish. Uh, not necessarily having anything to do with the reproductive status. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, John. Um, so um, I like that very much what you said, but I don't. I know that I don't understand it all. But if you were looking at recruitment, are there in the and the MPA has done everything it's supposed to do. Recruitment doesn't matter anymore because all the fish you got all the fish you're going to get, and it doesn't matter what happens to recruitment. Isn't there some state where it's like that? But then eventually, you know, is there a magic size of fish in some of these MPAs where that would tell you what's going to happen in the future and you're all set and you don't need to worry about recruitment? Is there a, a Goldilocks point of size of fish where you actually wouldn't have to worry about recruitment as much? But that fish is Say always going to... Maybe one-year-old yeah. fish yeah. that you can predict what's going to happen to them for the next 50 years if you can count the one-year-old fish or two-year-old fish or five-year-old fish. Oh, sure. Yeah. You could. Um, the problem with fish is that it's hard to age them, right? And so you, the only way to do it for sure is to kill it. And they frown on that in MPAs. And uh, so if you look at the size distribution, right, it's really easy to pick out the one-year-olds or even the larvae.
But beyond that, the growth curve smoothed everything out, so it's really hard to say, oh yeah, those are two-year-old fish. Um, so having the one fish whose age we know is the new guy coming out, so that's, it's easy to do it with that. Do they grow at the same rate everywhere? No. Uh, it'd be nice to have data on that, to include that in those projections. Um, particularly, you know, in Southern California, they're going to grow a lot faster in the warmer water than in the cooler water. Um, but getting the data to really parameterize that the right way is difficult. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I guess I should be repeating these for the microphone, right? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Okay, they can hear. Okay. Um, so, yeah, in Southern California, not necessarily Channel. Uh, I don't want to get too far out on a limb here. Um, the MPAs don't have a huge effect on the kelp forest for most of the duration of that study. Um, the main effect we've seen of MPAs on the kelp itself uh, in this in that area, uh, this is some work that Jen published a couple years ago, is that by protecting larger um, fish that have protected, well, let's see, larger fish have produced urchins which have allowed kelp to do a little bit better in some places and have actually inhibited the invasion of an invasive sargassum algae. Um, so there's been some effect of the MPA on the kelp. Um, in these populations, there were ups and downs from the kelp abundance. Um, you know, warmer water years or stormier years, there was less kelp. Uh, and that was all accounted for in that statistical model. So in years when there was less kelp, uh, fewer larvae moved from Smurf into the adult population, effectively. Yes, yeah, Scott? So Karen kind of had the intensity dependence seem sort of included in the model, but are they explicit? How do you deal? It's a good question. So in most of these systems, the, there theoretically would be a carrying capacity of the adult fish. And you could imagine that if you really got a huge number of adult fish, they'd start to sort of move out. Uh, we're never really getting to those densities. And most of the nonlinear density dependent sort of stuff that happens is happening right after they settle because they're competing for shelter spaces from predators and things like that. So that's uh, some work that uh, Darren Johnson did back in the 2000s with rock, uh, blue rockfish, I think, either blues or blacks, maybe kelp rockfish, actually possibly all three, show that the main source of that interspecific competition that leads to density dependence was happening at those very early stages. And most of that's happening before we count them in those kelp forest surveys. So we're sort of seeing the post density dependent part of the population, which makes us able to model it in the, with a linear model, essentially. We, we can ignore that process for the most part because it's already happened before we count the fish. Yeah, um, something I was thinking about when you were talking about the Point Lobos example, and you mentioned at the end when you were talking about, I think, the scorpion MPA, right. about the fish moving in and out of the MPA. And I was wondering with the blue rock fish, uh, when you showed the site that I think you were comparing, look at the sites are right at the edge of the MPA. Do you think there's any effect there of the fish moving in and out? Or, and if so, do you have a way of accounting for that in the model? That's a good question. So that would show up as... Uh, a lower than expected trajectory of fish inside the MPA. Um, and that's not something we accounted for really in this study. One thing that I didn't show here, but that if you went to the RU symposium at the end of the summer here, I had an RU student in the summer who was using that same F estimating tool on the data after the MPAs went into place to see if there was really no fishing inside the MPA. Um, at least in Southern California, almost all the MPAs had zero fishing in them. They had, there was no evidence there was fishing happening. Um, so you, you can test for that, um, although I didn't show that here. But it, yeah, it's a good question. If you're right there at the edge, you expect to have those fish spilling over and getting caught. Yeah, yeah Pop. Well, um, back to your comment about the density dependence. <coughs> Most of what you were showing was actually more recruitment than it. Right. Uh, and you would have, in some cases, two order magnitude variability. So I, maybe I misunderstood, but you were just then saying that post oh, sediment density dependent processes for moderating that out. I didn't see that in your model, right? So, yeah, you're right. It, uh, so that's true that probably for most of these systems, we're, you know, if you think about uh, whiteboard in here, if you think about density dependence, right, uh, if you're at fairly low densities, an increase in the number of recruits just increases the number of fish, and eventually that levels out, and we're probably mostly on that sort of increasing linear part of the curve. Um, only, And we know that only because 
just plopping those larvae right in there into the model provides a really good fit to the data. You're absolutely right. Uh, but separately, the fish, so I'm comparing larvae caught on Smurfs to fish counted somewhat later in the kelp forest, presumably after any of those sort of nonlinear things would have happened. So I'm, I sort of remain agnostic about what that process might be, but likely it's we're still in that linear part of it. Yeah, is that okay? All right. Are there any local species interactions with any of the species you've been looking at in these cases? So like you're taking fishing mortality into account and oceanographic conditions and things, but say there's a different species that was being heavily fished and now it's increasing a lot and now competing in or they're yeah, competing for habitat and things like that. Yes, uh, I don't believe in those. <laughs> uh, no, so there totally is, and, I, and for that reason, I, when we published, I showed an example earlier with red sea urchin, and I was actually a little bit wary about showing that example in the paper, because that's a classic example where, um, not in all of California, but in parts of California, the MPAs are increasing the abundance of things that eat red sea urchin. And so you actually shouldn't expect to see that much increase, because we have more sheephead and lobster and things like that that chow down on the urchins. For most of the rock fishes and other things like that, these are very diffuse predation systems, so there's not really strong predator-prey interactions. Everybody kind of eats everything that's smaller than it, uh, and uh, you don't necessarily expect to see a lot of variability explained by accounting for any kind of multi-species thing, which is why you can do single-species models, which is great. Um, so the study was designed to have MPAs and reference sites that are in ecologically similar areas. And um, so any pollution effects you might see would be shared by those. Um, for the sites I showed you, there's not a big concern about that. There are some MPAs on the mainland of Southern California that could be affected by things like stream outflow from the LA River and other sorts of sources. And maybe that's not so great for those populations, but it's not a big concern for these guys.